it, it, it oftentimes, and I think unfortunately, it's, it's almost exclusively sort of narrowed by the financial nature of, of the way in which, of course, you know, we are investing in these projects and, and we're expecting, we're on the expectation sort of are defined. Mm -hmm. um, but for example, just to kind of like highlight another opportunity in that regard is that going back to the Looking Alliance for Sustainable Energy, when we approached Con Edison, uh, with one of our partners, uh, the, the Brooklyn Alliance for Sustainable Energy is made a coalition of various organizations, Invest by Restoration and Uja, uh, but where we also partner, we're beginning to uh, build alliances with other uh, groups, like for example, Block Power. Mm -hmm. And this is an organization that has been working on, on with us on, on creating uh, the business model where the notion of capital includes the willingness and the in the social uh, resources required for Con Edison's initiatives to work in places like Brownsville, where in addition to improving the infrastructure, they need people to collaborate on turning their ACs on and off or the lights on and off during certain periods of the day. Otherwise, they will not reach you know, the goals. And that social capital is being projected as a potential uh, exchange where residents who don't have the financial capital to, let's say, engage in you know, these opportunities centered on energy can actually participate and receive a share of, of in, a, in a cooperative model that can then redistribute revenues. Mm -hmm. so, so it's important to think about that from, from the investment point of view, but also your, the, 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 the idea of capital that you're suggesting also requires that we talk about how are we evaluating the success of these interventions because when we also sit with yeah. Con Edison and the environmental regulators, the city of New York, the way in which they're thinking about how we evaluate the success of these investments is always a financial cost effectiveness. And there are interventions that will never ever be financially cost effective. For a local industrial business to replace the roof or to build a, um, a water holding tank that will never ever be financially cost effective, but it's an environmental priority, mm -hmm. right? In because our current model, it's not. I'm sorry. Yeah. In the current model, in the financial, right. from a financial yeah. cost effectiveness <laughs> money, it's not because they're not going to generate any savings. They're not going to generate any any money out of it. But it is an environmental losses. priority. They, they could offset catastrophic losses. I mean, maybe it's only the insurance companies who are thinking about that. But if you think about the losses from a catastrophic storm, right? But that's, that's not money. money. But that is not money, the, right? The current framework. What I'm trying to suggest is that I'm, I actually, actually, I agree with you. The benefits of doing something like this are the public health implications and environmental benefits. But that's not yeah, money right now. Well, I think that's a good signal to open up the discussion. <laughs> you guys are going to say something. Come on. <laughs> so, if anybody has any comments or questions, though. Please feel to interrupt the way the gentleman did. Please, yes. <laughs> no, no, please. No, as you Thank should. You. you should have done that. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm totally naive about all of this, but I was impressed to hear the, the num the sep this number thrown out of 7,000 experiments that have been done. And what you're facing in terms of selling your idea is to prove that it will work, but call it novel. So if you can cobble together a, something that you can call a new idea, but show that the various components of it have already been proven effective, it might <coughs> flop. That, that's out of a lifetime of probably together biology grants. <laughs> but. Let me ask a question that Colvin left me. A number of years ago, when a group of Pratt students, uh, uh, Anusha Ben Kadmon and others, were working in the Broadway Triangle, uh, they came up with the concept of if they planned buildings that would be energy plus, in other words, they were generating more energy than they would use, and if they also conserved energy through techniques like the ones you were describing, where the residents themselves would shut down to, you know, or reduce their utilization rates during certain periods of time, that they would literally form a company 
to sell both the savings as well as the excess energy to the major utility. Uh, and in essence, we're proposing a community-owned utility. Uh, has any has there been any discussion with Con Edison around that kind of a model? Yeah. Yes. So there is. So going back to Rev. Um, and, and sort of like this dual goal that besides encouraging clean energy resources, they want to uh, increase the, um, the engagement of the customers. For the first time, the regulations are changing to allow somebody to be able to sell energy back to the grid. So in a way, the mechanism works as um, sort of like this exchange where you right now could produce energy that you sell to the grid and then you receive savings in your bill. Uh, that's called net metering. Uh, but in order to be able to fully implement that, besides the regulatory requirements that are changing, right, at the state level, uh, building code and a lot of the local laws need to change in order to allow the type of infrastructure changes required for this to happen in single, multifamily, and different types of buildings. And, and we're not there yet. See, what we, we were proposing was slightly different. And that was rather than individuals negotiate with Con Edison, is that they would form a cooperative entity that would negotiate the rates. And it would be the collective amount that would then be distributed back to the families. And it would not only would they wind up with savings, but they might also control the way the uh, electromagnetic devices were installed and who did the installation and where did they purchase it from so they could, be, they could build up a local economy. There is in the, I don't know if, if, you, if you want to do a little bit on that, but the, the, in, the, in the proposal that, uh, that, it's, uh, that was awarded uh, 100 million by NYSERDA under the price competition for Brownsville, the idea is to create a cooperative because you can, you can build on that initial model to, to really create a distributive energy sort of resource right. where you can connect multiple but it also, What I think is interesting, what Ram was talking about, and also I think it is sort of this questioning the status quo a little bit. So the electrical grid that we have now, the capital investment that cities need to put forth to maintaining our electrical systems and our water systems uh, is, is running out. I mean, the impacts of climate change are making it really impossible to keep coupling use with rates, right? Like the more you use, the more you pay. That's going away now, right? So the capital investment in order to keep our drinking water at the level that it needs to be, right? and to keep our energy grid at the level that it needs to be, as it currently exists, is no longer really based on this idea of use. So we have to come up with these different models, and I think utilities are really recognizing this, and so they're reaching out to folks like, oh, we're gonna text you to use less water, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna ask you to reduce your energy consumption, so. What is the Uber of utilities? <laughs> what is the Uber? I mean, Uber doesn't own cars, Uber, Take this, this, these are the new models that are out there that are taking on, but when it comes down to what you're mentioning, this intelligently distributed microgrid, 2100 reports are looking at that future for the state of New York that every town is its own microgrid, and within that town, critical infrastructure and critical facilities have their own microgrid, which means the power authority and the grid as we know it today will go away or needs right. to go away. Yeah. That's what we're getting at, which means the loss of power and inefficiency of how it's done now goes away. That has to happen. If it doesn't happen, not just COP21, but that doesn't happen, what Jane is talking about, the stress and resources now does not match demand. And you might remember years back, Con Edison came and changed all the light bulbs in your house for free. Remember that? They went to fluorescent because you just put slack in the grid. Because we're gonna come, we're gonna pay for you getting free light bulbs, and then by the way, it doesn't seem to viable, but you just put all the slack in the grid that they can sell you no power. That's what it was, so they didn't have to upgrade their infrastructure. They were so behind in upgrading their infrastructure, they couldn't keep up with it for roundouts. So this was, hey, this is a good PR move, but in the end, there's the reality. But what we're moving towards is exactly that. So you have to ask the question, what is the Uber for infrastructure? So harvesting your rainwater, monetizing your roof for whether it's energy production, water harvesting, whatever it may be, that has to be part of the living in the 21st century, that microcosm of how each person can do it for their building. And you are an equity stakeholder when you do that because you've just reduced your outflow. And you might start to be able to sell that. But right now the laws and books 
you, you can sell it back, but it has to be an agreement with Con Edison. If you don't sell it back dollar for dollar, you sell it back, back on either 20% of what it's actually worth. So they're actually selling the, yeah. the energy you produce back to somebody else at full value. So it's a money-making proposition now, but when it gets to the tipping point where more people are generating energy and selling it back, then, then what does Con Edison do? Trust me, there's, there's a lot of things on there. Yeah, uh, I have actually, Oh, Why don't you tell everybody who you are? Oh, I'm Eva Hanhart. I uh, teach in the FAT program. Um, and I've known Ron almost as long as uh, Colton has. So uh, um, I, uh, had, I wanted to follow up uh, something that I thought I heard you say uh, when you were talking about the codes and some of the regulations not being adequate now and that there is a push towards now. but the, Part of that push is trying to get the people who actually have the uh, control, the power, and the money, the capital, if you will, uh, and are investing in new construction, are investing in uh, uh, new infrastructures, uh, to buy into the regulation so that the government will go along with it. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if I may not be presenting it correctly, but you can. My question is, did I understand that correctly? And is there not similarly a still a real danger? Uh, I was somewhat concerned about your using Uber because ultimately the people, the new Con Ed, i.e. the new corporate entity, will uh, be the one who, not the kind of community based, even within individual municipalities. We've seen this in water systems, we've seen it in other things. Uh, how, how do you see making that shift? Because a lot of the ability to deal with equity uh, and economy are, 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 uh, is really dependent on, and I'm going to sound like Bernie Sanders, uh, is really on actually democratizing uh, the uh, the ability and resources to both influence government and the other. Now, was I correct in understanding? So you had, you, said? you had two distinct questions. One is about the codes. The codes um, are better each, their link, each each time each time they come out. What I was showing you was that the current code that was just adopted is in adoption for New York State, which is the 2015 code. Mm -hmm. Actually, has wind, water, really stringent energy compared to what the last code round was. But what I showed you was to get to the COP21, that is the gulf between where our code stands now and where we need to be. So we are, as the AIA have been asked and working with the Department of State, rewriting and writing the code as well as recommendations for the city, which means all city buildings and governing buildings will adhere to a more stringent code than that next code adoption. But the idea is to get to 80 by 50, New York City is going to take all of its city-owned buildings and start moving that direction in any federally uh, funded contracts, city-owned contracts, state contracts, <coughs> will all adhere to a well-beyond code very quickly to match that. That will eventually become how we all build. But we also have to take a look at only 10% of the buildings out there are built by architects. The other 90% is everybody else. And more often than not, are they doing code? And Michael Langerfeld, you have a question about that? You no, I have a response. Yeah. And as recent as this last legislative session, the Homeowners Association wanted to extend the length of the code from three years current to six years so they don't have to adhere to it. So we're That's fighting funny. that on the other side. Yeah. And 80% of the residential inventory in the United States was not built by a person licensed for the health, safety, and welfare of public. Yeah. So our impact, as, as much as we're going to try, we're going to, and the other half of your question, I'm not sure, sure I understood about the, the Uber portion. Um, what I'm advocating for, because I don't have an answer for it, is for us to look at wholesale change and recognize the opportunity by which we can democratize things instead of, Con Edison is the only power authority. Why are they setting the price? I can respond to that a little bit because, and then by the way, I sit on the 80 by 50 yeah. uh, committee, and I can assure that the conversation, which is where I differ from Jamie a little bit, in that 
cannot be just about the infrastructure improvements. You're right. They're not talking about labor and they're not talking about equity. They're only focused because the challenge is so big on the uh, infrastructure strategies, but that's not enough. Uh, to build on, on Ella's question, this, the, the, as, as soon as people begin kind of like building their solar panels in their buildings and disconnecting from Connect, which is great because we're increasing clean energy resources, the number of customers that the utility has begins to drop. The minute the number of customers begins to drop, the prices of the energy begins to rise. Yeah. So those who do not have access to the capital or the roof to begin with um, will have to remain connected to Con Edison. And that's where the exponential costs of energy begin. And so if we don't address that right now, regardless of how efficient the strategies or the technologies are, we will be exacerbating the problem. Yeah. Unless we go to totally distributed microgrids that are owned block by block or community by community. There it right? is. Yeah. We've That's got more blocks and more Yes, uh, Leonardo Ponce, I'm an alumnus of the environmental systems program and currently teach there as well. Uh, it's kind of, I want to kind of piggyback off what Pamela was saying because it's a response to, you can change the codes also. It's not just the, the, the policies. You can change the codes, you can change the regulations, you can try and enforce this. But even the buildings that are built by architects, they are not often built to code. And not only are the regulatory uh, processes to try and enforce this code not really in place, but the affordability of enforcing this code and the, the access to, to uh, of the regular building owners and of the regular tenants and the people living in the city is not really there to try and enforce that code. And that goes along with the information gap. So there, there does need to be incentivization not just of the implementation of these technologies uh, for the public at large, but there also needs to be a broader sharing of information and education movement that goes along with that. I think that is really the main gap. Because if you don't educate everybody, then there won't be public pressure. There won't be, uh, there won't be knowledge base to actually agree on change. Yeah, but that's the interconnectivity. You're right. Juan's right, I'm right, Jamie's right. All of those are part of the puzzle because code alone won't do it, enforcement alone won't do it. There's always bad players, bad actors. Um, that's why we have these discussions because you're absolutely right. But, yeah, I just didn't want to I think it was good that you, yeah. you know, projected that because it's, you can't really just start vilifying people that are just trying to also make a living. Yeah. Oh, no, no, By of course. course. Good allies going forward. Yeah. No, you're right. And in other words, and in other words, I mean, I, I don't know if, if, if correct me if I'm wrong, but you're also alluding to the fact that the state has a role here. These are public services. Yeah. Yes. You can't just like throw this to the market, and it's not fair that people have to develop these cooperatives alone. That's how that's happened. Right. But the rest of the state has a responsibility. In it. Absolutely. I'm not advocating for for chaos, but I'm advocating for we need to recognize that this change underfoot is emerging new ways of doing things, and so that has to be part of the solution. You have to harness that and recognize that the disturbance we're in is only the beginning. That the ways of doing things, the way we make money, the way we pay for things. Currently, if you are finishing college now, your expectation, how many jobs do you think you're going to have? When I graduated, I was expected to have seven jobs in my lifetime. What is it now? 42. <laughs> Four, you will have 42 jobs based on where you are, 42 different jobs. And they will be multiple at the same time because I can make money doing all of these different things at once. That is a complete wholesale change in how we do business fundamentally. It's not, I'm an architect, I go to work, I come home. No, I'm making money in multiple ways. And it's only with the next generation the same way. So how do we recognize that that entire change of how we make money, distribute wealth, and do things is, is is in its disturbance. That is part of this discussion. It has to be. We can't do things as they've been done the last 100 years because it just doesn't work. How do you held the same job now for 50 years? Steady state. What's the source of that 42 jobs? <laughs> um, so there's a there. There's a lot of work being done at. Um, the American Institute of Architects, we rely on information coming from what's called you know, the Future Workforce Jetpack. We started working on it through the Young Architects Forum. And we started looking at labor statistics and what 
um, the expectation of jobs to money and livability, all of those things, because the, there are very few architects in the United States. It is, it is one of those um, professions, it's not very profitable. You go into it because you want to help people in communities. You, you're not wealthy. So in looking at this, looking at what the trend and the next generation and what their economy is and how they make money is assembled and put together for us from everything from the Brookings Institute all the way down to universities who study this and labor statistics at the federal government. And it's fascinating to see what the next generation looks at and the power of the economy and what their expectation is. Their expectation is not to work a 40 hour week. Their expectation is not to work a 20 hour week. Their, op their opportunity is to look at how they generate revenue and a lifestyle within the context of what they want to do. It's a fascinating, fascinating, wow, I think that's fascinating a, thing. It is, but it's also a very privileged space, it is. right? I mean, like, it so is. getting back to this idea of what I wish Colvin was here to add to this conversation, I mean, he was talking about immediate needs, like from, right. you know, an hour or two or three from now, but to have the bandwidth to be able to orchestrate and curate my life and my workplace yeah. is an amazing privilege. And so I think that, you know, we could take that out of the realm of architecture and we could talk sure. about now for everyone and this idea of a living wage job and how, you know, if we're going to actually capitalize on our resiliency initiatives and innovations, we have, at the base of it has to be this idea of living wage jobs so that, you know, everyday folks without that type of privilege, you know, have an opportunity to work one job rather than working four or five just to meet their basic needs. Right. So I think that's where this, these same organizational models work for various at the time we were struggling uh, 50 years ago in Bedford Stuyvesant to begin to think about how do we deal with the, the devastating